Very compelling vision at the White House in, in mid-April. And one of your key points was that we're never going to make adequate progress until we zero in on, teacher, on the teacher development pipeline. Can you kind of recap your concerns and the opportunities you see and, and, and zero in a little bit on the teacher quality issue? Thank Great. you. And you can Great. stand there or you can sit here. It's up to you. No, I'll stand just here Great. if that's all right, as long as the mic's working. So um, to, to begin with, um, I'll just concentrate on the math part of STEM. And um, math, early math is just surprisingly important. Many of you may have heard the research by Greg Duncan and colleagues, for instance, that early mathematics is not only predictive of later mathematics success, but is the best predictor of high school graduation and entry into college. It predicts later reading success as, much, as well as early literacy skills do. Not that there's a contest between the two, but it's clear that although numbers and shape are important, there's something else about early STEM that is predictive, it, that's cognitively fundamental. The reasoning and the thinking of early STEM, <laughs> not just the content, is probably very important. And there's other surprises too. It's surprising how deep, broad, and sophisticated kids' thinking can be. Uh, Abby was just short of four years of age. Um, she was playing with these five trains. She, her, her parents brought home these five little trains from a conference. And she was playing with them. Her mom came in and said, oh, you're playing with your trains. There's, where's the other ones? She's got three trains in front of her, three little train engines in front of her. And she said, well, this is one, two, and three. I'm missing four and five. No, this is one, three, and five. I'm missing two and four. So not only was she thinking abstractly about number, but she was playing with numbers. She was playing with the idea that I can number these things any way I want to, and I'm going to find two numbers that are missing, uh, no matter what. This kind of surprisingly deep, interesting curiosity about mathematics is what I think we have to uh, convey. And we especially have to convey it to teachers, because the third surprise is how surprising it is to their teachers what capability the kids have for learning. So study. Started in the Netherlands, duplicated in two other countries after with very similar results. They tested the kids after they finished preschool, and then they asked the preschool teachers and the trainers of those teachers to predict how well kids would do on that test. I'll just give you one item. The hardest one was subtraction. No objects, a 10 minus 8. What percentage of your kids do you think can get that right? Now, remember, they just finished teaching these kids, right? So, the actual percentage of kids compared to the prediction is striking. The teachers and the teacher trainers in four different groups of, the, of these people all were about four or five percent. In other words, maybe one, maybe none out of a class, you know, <laughs> could do this, but maybe one kid could do it. No, actually 40 to 50 percent of the kids could s successfully solve that problem. These were the teachers that just finished teaching these kids. So it's uh, surprising. How, what a gap there is between what teachers think kids can do and what their own te kids that they were working with think they could do. All right, next surprise. We do know a lot, a surprising amount, about how kids learn. Julie and I have put that in what we call learning trajectories, right? And Julie always worked with teachers and says, you know, it's like you want to get to that wall. You want to get over there. What are the steps you have to take to get over there, right? This is, this is what, what's the problem is in STEM very often, when the goal is over there, teachers just teach that exact skill over there. And they're missing all these kind of steps. We all talk about start where the child is. But what does that mean if you have no idea how to say where along those steps the child is and what's the next step that you want to take the kid to? But we know a surprising amount, but there's a huge gap between what we know and what we do in, in colleges and training institutions and everything else. Another surprise is how influential once you get teachers teaching about learning trajectories, thinking about learning trajectories, that can be. So Julie and I have, in, in our scale-up projects in Boston, Buffalo, and Nashville, find that not only do we raise math scores, and that's great, but we also get an effect on oral language. 
in, in areas that have nothing to do with mathematics. Because when you ask kids, as our curriculum and our approach does all the time, how do you know? Kids have to dig very deep metalinguistically and cognitively to be able to talk about, how did I solve that? What is my thinking about that, right? We think that's why it transfers not only to language, but executive thinking. So to step back a little bit, for the scale up, what are they learning? They're learning the three parts of learning trajectories. They're learning the mathematics that they may not have a, a firm handle on. They're learning this developmental progression of levels of thinking. And they're also learning what activities then go along with each level to facilitate growth to the other. So let me give you an example, a couple examples of the activities and, and just a very quick review of how they can hit different levels. One of kids' favorite activities in geometry, for instance, is what we call state step. Step. So the teacher uses painter's tape, puts a whole bunch of shapes of different types all over the floor, and then the kids, either with music or, or something like that, are walking all around, and then the teacher yells out, rectangle. And all the kids have to find a rectangle and go get in a rectangle. Now at the beginning, all they have to do is recognize visually a rectangle and be able to name it. Then the next step on this learning trajectory, then the teacher asks them, how do you know Right? And they have to start talking about, well, it's got all right angles and the like. And then eventually, the teacher will say, OK, ready? More than one right angle. Wow, now they've got to think about the properties of that shape. So either for the whole class, a group of kids or individual kids, if the teacher knows that these are the kind of steps in geometry learning and all, so they can modify these activities. Looks like everybody's playing the same activity, but she can easily modify those kind of activities to be along this learning trajectory. And this starts early, and we've got to start making that case very clearly. For instance, take another geometry example. Wyatt was just moved into a toddler classroom. No language, almost no language whatsoever. After just a, a, a few weeks in that classroom, Wyatt is starting to talk. He calls a circle no angles. He, when the teacher said rectangle, he went like this and said, right angle checker, you know, for, for, for about that. And the teacher, also following this kind of learning trajectory, put all her shapes on the board and then every day would turn them just a little bit so they would start mm -hmm. to see them mm -hmm. in a different perspective so they don't call a square that's rotated a diamond all of a sudden and not a square. Wyatt came in, saw <coughs> one of the shapes had been rotated and said, rhombus fell down. The teacher says these are some of the first multi-word statements he's made, right? So these are the kind of uh, sensitivity to learning trajectories in life. <coughs> we know that it works. We know you need follow through. One more surprise is how often people misinterpret it. You talk about the framing issue, right, Nate? Um, uh, fade out. Early effects fade out. Preschool effects fade out. Really? Really? You mean uh, the, 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 everything we taught the kid just faded from their brains? No, that's not what we mean. The researchers mean the effect size or the difference between them and a control group became less. But that doesn't mean it's a catch-up phenomenon, not a fade-out phenomenon. And how we phrase these things has incredibly important policy implications. Because if it's fade-out of preschool effects, if the preschool effects are no, no good, no useless, they lack vitality or something, right? Then, then OK. Maybe putting a lot of money into preschool doesn't make sense. But if it's the fact that the other kids caught up because the kindergarten that these kids went to is a wasteland in STEM, then that has very different implications for where you would spend your money and your resources. So, gotta, gotta, gotta stop. Um, <laughs> you, can say, you can say two more sentences. Two more sentences? Okay. Yeah. How, do I, how long of a All sentence right, can I? <laughs> I think I got it. I think I got it. So, so, Another framing issue, another framing issue is this play. I get what Lynn was saying. I get what, um, who was it, Betty was saying about we need play, right? But I think it's a false dichotomy. We think of, of good early math as either we have to do it through play or we're going to have to give worksheets. You know, false dichotomy, bad ends. And even play, I think, uh, we need to rethink that. It's not play versus STEM, right? It's, it's uh, 
it's, it's playful STEM and it's STEM-induced play that we need to combine to do this. It's not that we need kids to do better, uh, more, more math. We also need them to do better math. Yeah. It's not that we need to have kids do better in math as much as we need better math in kids, a higher quality, more interesting kind of STEM uh, that, that kids will incorporate. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Thank you. Having those kind of video things and examples and then allowing people to dig deeper. And it'd be nice if what happened from my perspective on the Common Core is, you know, many of the vast majority of the states got together on the Common Core and agreed to it. It wasn't federal, it was, you know, the National Governors Association. And then they all broke off to do their own PD and their own little implementation. Yeah. And that, I, I wish we had, you know, the 10 million to, to organize the states and say, let's share the resources as, uh, such as that or whatever we come up with, the ideas you two had, you know, across the states instead of everybody breaking down and doing their yeah. own thing fairly poorly in many cases. Yeah. So uh, I will let that be the last word. This is an excellent panel. Thank you all so much. <laughs>